Okay, um, I'd like to thank the, uh, the organizers for inviting me to this really interesting conference and giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit um, about our work. Um, so I'd like to start with the central dogma introduced by Francis Crick in the 1970s. I think that shouldn't need too much of an introduction. So this was formulated to, to illustrate the belief at the time that information flow in biological systems is unidirectional from DNA into RNA and then into proteins. Later it turned out that this is only partially true, at least between RNA and DNA, the information flow can be reversed by the actions of reverse transcriptases and in a limited, a limited way by telomerase as well. So the, the fact that these two polymers can exchange information, that information can be written from DNA into RNA and from RNA back into DNA, I think naturally leads to the question, why just two? Kind of, could there be other polymers with which DNA or possibly RNA could exchange information? So we ask ourselves the question, if we could conceive of simple chemical alternatives to DNA and RNA, um, and would these also be capable of heredity uh, and evolution? And to do this, you need a chemical framework, and we call these kind of XNAs for xenonucleic acids. They don't occur in nature. And to sort of add these two extra arrows to the central uh, dogma diagram, what you really need is an XNA polymerase to write information from DNA into XNAs, and once you're there, you need an XNA reverse transcriptase to uh, write information back into DNA. And if you can do that, if you can close that, that loop, um, we have a replication cycle for, uh, for XNAs via a DNA intermediate, a little bit like retroviral uh, replication, and that opens the XNA sequence space uh, for exploration. And, and in that sequence space, you know, there will be functions and I'm going to tell you a little bit about ligands. We can make XNA aptomers, you can make catalysts, XNA enzymes, and you can also build uh, simple nanostructures uh, and devices, which I won't tell you about. And when we started this, we didn't just want to do this for one. We wanted to be able to do this at will uh, for a number of backbones and really as far as many as we can do. So step one, we need an XNA polymerase to go from DNA to XNA. And the XNAs we started with, um, uh, these two are going to talk mostly about HNA. So this is HNA and <coughs> CNA, where the five-membered ribofuranose ring of DNA and RNA is replaced with six-membered congenus cyclohexanil in CNA and hydrohexatol in, in HNA. And the reason we chose these is really because they have remarkable properties. So these, uh, at the nucleoside level and also as polymers, uh, are non-toxic, so they do not uh, interfere uh, with the cellular metabolism, they're orthogonal. And this is really, can't be taken as a given. Many, many uh, nucleoside and nucleotide analogs are potently toxic. They're potent antiviral and anti-cancer drugs. So these are uh, orthogonal. That's, um, as polymers, they're also completely resistant to nuclease degradation. So this is HNA. You can see here, DNA goes very quickly with DNAs1 and even quicker with BAL31, which is sort of shredding Shred, microbial shredder enzyme, while HNA is largely impervious. Same in serum, DNA goes relatively quickly and really HNA stays there for as long as you like. <clears throat> but importantly, they, they retain the ability to specifically hybridize to both DNA and RNA, and that's clearly important for, uh, uh, for information transfer. <clears throat> but um, Orthogonality, as I said, you know, has its price. They're truly terrible polymerase substrates. When we started, you know, this is sort of how, how good we could get. I'm just going to quickly <coughs> introduce what these gels tell you. So this is a primer extension gel. You're going to see a few of those. So this is a nice semi-qualitative way <coughs> to measure polymerase activity. You label a primer at the five prime end. You let the polymerase extend it and resolve the products on a, on a polyacrylamide gel. So to each... So each of these rungs of the ladder <coughs> to the closest approximation denotes an incorporation step. And you can see this is the best polymerase we could find. This is a replicative polymerase from an archaea bacteria called Thermococcus gorgonarius. And you can do about one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven incorporation step, and then it's curtains. You won't go any further, however long you wait. <coughs> so at the time, this was really <coughs> not, um, not good enough for uh, the type of uh, screening and selection systems that were available, so we built our own. 
and this is called compartmentalized self-tagging, CST, that's how we call it. And it's really a very simple method. It's based on a positive feedback loop whereby a polymerase extends its own encoding, uh, sorry, uh, tags its own encoding gene, or in this case, the genetic element containing its own encoding gene by extension of a primer. And this primer, importantly, hybridizes only in a metastable way uh, to the plasmid. So it needs to be stabilized, this interaction needs to be stabilized by this extension, and the primer also has a 5' prime capture tag. And to ensure uh, genotype-phenotype linkage, we encapsulate these into the aqueous compartments of a water and oil emulsion. Uh, so there, so to talk you through it, the red polymerase can use XNA triphosphates, it can extend the primer, so when we break the emulsion, you can capture this plasmid um, via the capture tag on a magnetic bead, uh, the light blue uh, polymerase cannot, and this, this gene will be lost from the gene pool. And once we were able to get this to work, um, you know, we very quickly arrived at the polymerase that can do HNA. So this is 6G12, you can see this is our starting point. Now we can synthesize easily 73, we can go a lot further, but this is just a tRNA gene, just to show that we can do an actual biological uh, gene. Okay, so we're here, now we need to go back. I mean, this is just a band on a gel, not, not very interesting. We really want to know, we want to decode the information that's contained in that a band, and for that we need to build a reverse transcriptase. Again, no natural polymerases display any HNART activity. So we decided to build one from the ground up again based on TGO because we know it well. And this time we used a <clears throat> bioinformatics technique called statistical coupling analysis. So this was introduced by Lockless and Rana, uh, Ranganathan. And it's really based on the idea that, um, that distant areas of a protein communicate with each other through interacting networks of amino acids, and that these networks uh, reveal themselves in phylogeny and can be mapped out through statistical techniques. Um, really the the quality of this analysis rises and falls with the quality of your uh, sequence alignment. So we build a hand-curated database of, of polymerases for alignment. This just shows the cluster analysis. And then the, the scar residues plotted onto the polymerase structure in orange together with the highly conserved residues in cyan. And you can see it sort of makes sense, kind of, if you get a continuous surface that encloses the primer template duplex, but you, what you can also see, you get far too many hits, kind of. It's not clear where to start, really, to build uh, the desired activity that we're after. So we try to route this um, analysis to this residue here. So this is a residue that was described by the biotech company Stratagene to convert RNA reverse transcriptase activity on a related polymerase from pyrococcus. Um, when we mutated it, um, it gave us nearly RNA nor HNA reverse transcriptase activity, but uh, we decided to look in the vicinity. We thought maybe a solution can be found in the close vicinity of this residue. Of these 15 residues in the close vicinity, four were also part of these SCAR networks, and one of these uh, when mutated, actually, uh, I think isoleucine to leucine, so a really subtle mutation, gave us very, very excellent um, uh, reverse transcriptase activity, and that really closes the loop. So now we can uh, move the genetic information from DNA into HNA, this entirely unnatural genetic polymer, and we can read it out with an HNA reverse transcriptase because we're going via DN intermediate, these can be cloned and sequenced very easily, and the information transfer proceeds with a, um, I think, very decent uh, fidelity of about 1 in 10 to the minus 3. This is uh, roughly equivalent to what you get in viral, in, in RNA viruses. Okay, and once we figured out to do it with HNA, we very quickly figured out to do it how with CNA, uh, Anna and Fana are uh, based on arabinofuranose rings rather than ribofuranose rings. TNA is an interesting case based on a tetrose rather than a pentose. And some of you may, may have encountered the interlocked rings of LNA, which are important in, in, in biotechnology. Um, different, um, different polymerases are needed for different of these XNAs, but they all share mutations in the so-called thumb domain of the polymerase. We never find any mutations in the active site. Um, and exactly what these mutations do, we're still in the process of figuring out, but that's a story 
uh, for another day. So we can do uh, information transfer backwards and forwards into XNAs. What about evolution? Now, to look at evolution, we turn to these aptamers. These are biomolecular drugs based on single-stranded nucleic acids. I'm not going to introduce them again. I think uh, um, uh, Ichiro did that very well yesterday. Um, just to um, show you again, kind of, this is a structure of a thrombin aptamer bind to thrombin in orange, just to show you that these can really fit into the uh, uh, surfaces of a protein in really very much the same way as antibody can and have the potential to bind their targets with equal affinity and specificity, but they haven't really um, made good progress into the clinic because when they're discovered as DNA and RNA aptamers, they need to be extensively modified, like in this case with macogen, to, to survive within the body. So if we could start with HNA, which is undegradable, you know, we might have an interesting starting point and wouldn't need to uh, go through all of this uh, medicinal chemistry. So this is our <clears throat> HNA aptamer selection protocol. This is completely standard. Um, we start with a DNA random sequence library. We synthesize HNA and we get rid of the DNA with DNAs1. Um, we um, bind the library to a solid phase target. We wash away the non-binders. We loot the binders. We reverse transcribe. We PCR and we can start again. And the first target we, we, we went for is this RNA motif from... <coughs> Uh, HIV-1, this is called TAR, the virus needs this to grow, and many, many DNA and RNA aptamers have been described to it. They seem to interact mostly by this kissing loop interaction. You can see an RNA aptamer here. And we thought this, we thought we'd be really clever because we required a very small library. We would only randomize uh, a loop um, and um, would get a kissing loop interaction uh, in our HNA aptamers. But as it turned out, that was not to be. So, um, so this is a specificity assay um, for the different aptamers. So this is a cartoon of the TAR RNA motif. These are variants of TAR where the sequence regions shown in, uh, um, shown in magenta kind of like have been scrambled while retaining secondary structure. You can see the RNA aptamer will keep binding to all the HIV motifs that retain this loop interaction, but not to the ones where the loops sequences are scrambled. But the HNA aptamer requires, seems to require the full motif, including both this loop and the bulge. And there's a second one in the library, which doesn't care about the loop at all, but seems to instead target this bulge region. <clears throat> and we measured the affinities. So these have, you know, respectable affinities in the, in the sort of mid to low nanomolar range. Um, but really making uh, nucleic acids bind other nucleic acids um, is not that uh, interesting. So we try to make aptamers against the protein target. Henneglysozyme is nice and cheap, so we started with that. Again, many examples in the literature for comparison. And you can see, you know, we get decent binding with cross-reactivity to the related human uh, lysozyme. And again, um, you know, not great, but respectable affinities. And a very, very intriguing G and T rich sequence motif, and we're, we're trying very hard to, to crystallize the, um, the complex of these aptamers with Hennig lysozyme because we'd really like to know how these fold up. Um, just to show you that these are um, the proper ligands, they don't just bind to protein coat on plastic. So this is a plasma cytoma cell line which, re uh, which expresses uh, Hennig lysozyme as a membrane protein um, compared to the wild type line. You can see the aptamers very, very nicely pick out the, um, the Hennig lysozyme on the cell surface in the context of all the other proteins, specifically um, in a fax assay. You can see the wild type shows uh, no signal at all. And I've already told you these are non-degradable by nucleases. We've thrown the whole New England Biolabs catalog at them. They don't get degraded, but they're also chemically quite stable. So this, I don't know if you can see this, these are two biocore curves overlaid, one drawn out, one dashed. And this is before and after a three-hour exposure <clears throat> to pH 1 at 40 degrees followed by pH 9. Trust me, DNA does not survive this treatment. There's nothing left. While the two H and aptam, as you can see, neither, can, neither binding kinetics nor amplitude uh, is, is affected by this. 
And uh, my co colleague Jeffrey De Stefan has also been making aptamers against uh, HIV reverse transcriptase. These are picomolar binders, so they're really excellent. And this is in the fluoro arabino uh, framework. So clearly, I think there's a fairly general opportunity there to, to generate binders um, in this framework. Um, so we have ligands. What about enzymes? So this shows our disc uh, discovery strategy for enzymes, we wanted to make initially exon enzymes that would cleave a certain RNA sequence. So this starts with, with, with basically synthesizing our exonase from an RNA primer and having them fold back onto their RNA substrate. You can then uh, separate active uh, exon enzymes simply by a gel shift assay and, and go back to DNA by reverse transcription. And we very quickly found some um, endonuclease in the, in again, fluorarabino framework. You can see the enzyme here. You can see the cleavage. And the catalytic rate is, um, you know, not stunning again, but, uh, but respectable. And again, once we managed to do it for FANA, we managed to do it in a whole range of other XNAs um, with, with um, you know, slightly different um, properties. Um, but this is still catalysis where the substrate is, is natural. So in this case, you know, you could argue maybe, you know, maybe actually the catalytic function is at least partially encoded by the substrate. Substrate assisted catalysis is common in, in many enzymes. So can we make a completely synthetic catalyst? And, and this is this here. So this is an XNA ligase, exon enzyme. So both substrates are now also exonase as well as the enzyme shown here. <coughs> And this legates two pieces of fluoroarabino uh, uh, nucleic acid together. And you can see here, these are the proper controls. Only in the presence of both substrates and the enzyme do you get a ligation. And this now allows you to play games where we can ligate together the, um, the phanazyme endonuclease, sub, uh, hybridize it to its RNA substrate, uh, and get cleavage. So it's a sort of two-step uh, assembly um, of, of, of uh, where an XN enzyme assembles another XN enzyme. So I'd like to summarize this part of the talk. Um, so I think what this, what this shows really that, at least in this limited way, as far as we have explored it, both heredity and evolution, two fundamental properties of life, are not restricted to DNA and RNA, but can be implemented in you know, quite a range of, of, of different polymers. And presumably evolution is an emergent property of all information carrying properties that can be, um, um, that can be uh, replicated. And there's clear opportunities now for maybe reinvading biology with these uh, orthogonal backbones and trying to build orthogonal uh, genetic systems within the cell. There's also opportunities in biotechnology. This clearly expands the um, chemistry of nucleic acid polymers that can be replicated and uh, as I've shown you we can make aptamers and enzymes and also uh, nanotechnology objects and this, this sort of, sort of shows, a, shows a family picture of the various XNAs we have a few more added to this and you can also uh, as of recently we can you know increase the molecular uh, diversity further by introducing uh, non-canonical backbone linkages Okay, so um, for the second part of my talk, I'd like to get back to the central dogma. And I think another question that um, is immediately obvious when you look at this is, um, is how did the system get started? We need nucleic acids to make proteins and proteins to make nucleic acids. How do you, <clears throat> how do you build this up? How do you boot up life? Now, over 40 years ago, Francis Crick, Leslie Orgel, and Carl Vose um, proposed what seemed at the time a pretty far-fetched idea. And their idea was that our biology was preceded uh, by a primordial biology that lacked both DNA and proteins, uh, but relied on RNA as its main um, you know, molecule, not just for, for, for genetics, but also for metabolism. And... Um, at the time, as I said, it's a pretty far-fetched idea, but in the meantime, I think a, a lot of compelling, if, if circumstantial evidence has accumulated, that this, there is really a lot, um, lot to go for this idea. 
I mean, the structure of the ribosome is maybe the smoking gun of this, what is called the RNA world hypothesis commonly. But one, of, one cornerstone of this hypothesis um, is missing, and that is a, um, that is a replicase to replicate those uh, nascent uh, RNA genomes of the RNA world, an RNA replicase. And um, so it hasn't been found in biology, what can we do? Now, true to the dictum of my um, former teacher, uh, Albert Eschenmoser, a uh, great chemist from Switzerland, the origin of life cannot be discovered, it can only be reinvented. We decided to try to build such a replicase from scratch. Um, and our starting point is this amazing uh, ribosome discovered in David Bartel's lab at the Whitehead Institute. Still sometimes blows my mind that a molecule so simple can carry out such a sophisticated uh, molecular function. So this is an RNA polymerase ribosome. So this can read out a sequence on an RNA template and uh, synthesize its complement. You can see its action here, another primer extension gel. And you can see it can go to about 14 incorporations. It's not very fast. It takes 24 hours to do that. And, and then it can't go any further. So it's, it's pretty amazing. But unfortunately, we're some distance away from replicating uh, really itself or an RNA genome. So as a minimal goal, we set ourselves because the RNA, the R18, what it's called polymerase ribosome, is 200 nucleotides long. So the minimal goal we set ourselves is that we should be able to improve this to at least a level where it can synthesize RNAs as big as itself. So we're at 14, we need to go to 200. And I'm going to tell you now how we get there. Again, we let nature doing all the hard work. So there's another selection strategy that, which we call CBT for compartmentalized B tagging. Now this looks complicated, but fear not, I'll, um, I will explain, and it's not that difficult at all. So there is, it starts with uh, one micron beads. They contain a single, a double-stranded DNA gene encoding the ribosome, as well as about 10 to the four copies of this little squiggle here. This is an RNA hairpin. And we will encapsulate these again into the aqueous compartments of a water and oil emulsion to ensure genotype-phenotype linkage. And then we carry out a couple transcription ligation reaction. And what this does is it decorates the beads with about 10,000 copies of ribozyme. So when we break the emulsion, we now have this population of clonal beads, each containing uh, a multitude of ribozyme, but each bead just containing one species of ribozyme. We can then add the primer template, duplex, re-emulsify again, encapsulate them again, and now the ribosome can do its job, uh, synthesize RNA. And really, the rest of the workflow is all about converting this primer extension signal into a fluorescent signal that we can read out in, again, by flow cytometry, isolate the beads containing the best ribosomes, and start the cycle again. And we initially started with a just complete random sequence library appended to the five prime end of the ribosome. After just three rounds of selection, we isolated this clone here, C19. And this is now just one hour extension reaction. You can see the wild type can barely do anything, while this isolated clone is significantly superior. Um, and it has this rather intriguing hairpin domain here, so we thought, like, that's where the function lies. But when we analyzed it in detail, it turns out most of the improvement is encoded by this simple hexanucleotide sequence at the 5' prime end, which is also complementary to the 5' prime end of the template. So clearly what this does, it, it binds the enzyme to its template, presumably um, increasing it, its local, the local concentration and thereby increasing polymerase activity. Now, what we found is that, especially for longer, uh, trying to synthesize longer RNAs, not only did this hairpin domain not do anything, it was actually inhibitory. So we replaced it simple placeholder for A's, and that really unleashed the polymerase activity of this ribosome. We can now synthesize RNAs up to uh, 96 um, uh, nucleotides long, at least on a, on a sequence template that the, that the ribosome likes particularly. Unfortunately, it's not a uh, general uh, uh, RNA polymerase at this point. But we certainly were able to do 
uh, on a much shorter uh, sequence to, to begin to synthesize, rather than arbitrary RNA sequences, we can now synthesize <coughs> RNAs that actually encode a function. So this is a hammerhead RNA endonuclease ribozyme. You can see the wild type kind of cannot make any full-length product, while our best ribozyme now can. And when you put it together with, temp with, uh, with its substrate strand here in red, you can see uh, you do get cleavage. So this is the ribozyme catalyzed transcription uh, of, of another ribozyme, clearly a process that uh, must have gone on uh, during the, the RNA world where you know, the replicates would transcribe genes from the RNA genome. Now, for the third part of the talk, I'd like to get back to uh, this picture here of the RNA replicates. Now, there's another thing that always bothered me about the RNA world hypothesis. Um, now, I don't know how many of you have worked with RNA. It's perfectly okay in, in the lab, in a nice clean Eppendorf tube, but it's a rather fragile molecule. It falls up to bits very rapidly at high pH, in the, at high temperatures, or in the, concentra in the presence of high concentrations of <clears throat> metal ions, and certainly in combinations thereof will destroy it very quickly. So, really, the problem is... Really, RNA is a questionable, if not downright, downright perverse choice of primordial genetic material because clearly the surface of the early Earth wouldn't have been such a benign place as our little clean Eppendorf tubes in the lab. And this uh, RNA polymerase ribozyme is a case in point. Even in the lab, under the best possible conditions, it actually falls to pieces in about two days because it requires high concentrations of magnesium ions for activity. So, really, either the RNA world hypothesis is wrong, and some people think so and have proposed pre-RNA worlds based on more stable polymers or alternative scenarios, or, and we like that um, approach better, we need to think of an environment where RNA makes more sense, where RNA could be stable, both stable and active. Um, as for stability, I think the solution is, is, is relatively obvious. What do you do in the lab if you want to preserve a molecule that is, um, that is perishable? That's right, you put it in the freezer. That's where they stay for long. But freezing enzymes is not a great way to preserve activity. So this is a proteinaceous RNA polymerase, T7 RNA polymerase. You can see nicely laddering at 37 degrees, but when you freeze it, it's dead. But the RNA polymerase ribosome is different. So when you freeze it, although it's a little bit slower, it will eventually go as far uh, as it does in, um, and on, on their ambient conditions. And what's more, because it's now frozen and more stable, there is something of the tortoise and the hare about it. While it's faster at ambient temperatures, in the ice it's slower, but it just keeps going and going and going. And if you adjust the conditions, you can actually go considerably further in the ice phase than you can go um, on the standard conditions. And the reason for that is that it would be wrong to think of ice as a uh, homogeneous uh, solid medium, and it's in fact a biphasic medium. So what happens when you freeze a uh, aqueous solution containing ions and RNAs and primers and triphosphates, the water freezes out first, but all the solutes get excluded into an aqueous brine phase that surrounds the ice crystals. So this can be seen in this scanning electron microscopy picture. This is a freeze fracture. You can see the hexagonal ice crystals here. And these are surrounded by these ridges, the so-called eutectic phase. This is a brine phase which surrounds the ice crystals and stays liquid at sub-zero temperatures. And that's where the ribozyme uh, does its work. Um, so the next question we asked ourselves, can we, you know, we can synthesize RNA in ice, what about evolution? And to do that, we simply replaced the second emulsion step in our uh, selection protocol by freezing. So instead of encapsulating the, uh, the, the clonal beads into the aqueous um, droplets in an oil phase, we just enclosed it into the eutectic phase pockets in the ice phase and carried through our uh, selection procedure. And when we did that, we uh, ended up with this ribosome here. You can see not only is it better than the wild type, but it's actually now more active when frozen than it is at ambient temperature. So this is now perfectly adapted to the ice phase. And when we combine this now with this 
hexanucleotide, this quasi shine dalgarno sequence that we discovered earlier on, we can now synthesize RNAs that are 206 nucleotides long. So this is the first ribosome <clears throat> to be able to synthesize RNAs longer than itself. It's clearly an important milestone on the road to self-replication. So I'd like to just summarize this part. So we found that I stabilizes the uh, RNA ribosome structure and activity. It enhances its activity actually while maintaining fidelity. I haven't shown you that. It and I haven't shown you that either. This is quite important in the context of the origin of life because of the tremendous concentration effect that happens during the freezing. Uh, this allows RNA replication from highly dilute starting concentration and it provides sort of a quasi-cellular compartmentalization within the uh, 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 eutectic phase microstructure and supports evolution. So clearly, you know, ice is attractive and really we were inspired by previous work uh, on, on the properties of, of ice by the late Stanley Miller, who's found that ice catalyzes various aspects <laughs> of nucleotide synthesis and also RNA oligomer synthesis from activated monomers. So this is work by Diemer, Monar, and Shostak, as well as some uh, RNA ligase activity, uh, that is Laura Landweber's work. And, and really this provides um, the raw materials for RNA evolution in C2 inside uh, the ice phase. And now how much time do I have? Uh, okay. So for the last part of the talk, um, I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about some of our recent work um, on, on other aspects of RNA assembly and replication. So if this is a sort of cartoon of how we get from chemicals, the primordial soup, to LUCA, there are now some pretty good, there's some pretty good evidence, some pretty good studies that suggest how we can go from simple primordial chemicals to <clears throat> at least some of the activated nucleotides and also amino acids and lipids. And other people have found ways to assemble in an untemplate way, untemplated way, activated nucleotides into short oligomers. And, you know, these may well be capable of non-enzymatic self-replication, and that is something that, among others, uh, Jack Shostak is exploring. And eventually there is a sort of idea that these will replicate and eventually progress to an RNA world where at some point we will have to progress to enzymatic self-replication to get to LUCA, the last common ancestor. But, but really, there's a little bit of a gap in between here, between those short oligomers, which actually have to be quite short, and enzymatic self-replication, which we think would probably require quite a complex uh, beast of at least 200 uh, uh, nucleotides long. So one question we asked ourselves, you know, wouldn't it be possible to actually have an intermediate replication stage where, um, where the RNA transitions between uh, sort of pools of short oligomers and fully assembled um, uh, complex ribosomes? Uh, this would also make the replication task easier because these short oligomers would be unstructured and therefore easier to replicate by the ribosome. So we wondered, can we, basically, can we assemble uh, the ribosome from its pieces? <clears throat> and to do this, it's an initial experiment. We split it into four chunks, about each about bit between 50 and 60, well, between 40 and 60 nucleotides long. Um, we used the hairpin ribosome. This is a ligase, or rather a rig ligase slash endonuclease enzyme, which carries out transesterification reactions. Um, and again, we use the ice phase to drive the reaction. And you can see, you can, you can, you can, uh, you can get full-length assembly um, about 96 hours, but uh, the yields are really not inspiring. Just 3% yield. Um, this is okay for some, for some things, but really to set up a replication cycle, that is, that is really not sufficient. So the question is, why is the yield so poor? Now, one hypothesis that we, that we had is that maybe a large fraction of these ligase ribosomes remain inactive in ice. And why do we think that? 
because misfolding is a pervasive issue in many functional RNAs. This is because, unlike with proteins, the energy landscape of RNA folding is, is, is rather flat, so RNAs tend to get trapped in lots of local minimas. And as this uh, review says from 2008, nearly every RNA whose folding has been studied has been found to adopt misfolded co uh, conformations. Now, in biology, this is all solved by having an army of RNA chaperones and helicases which um, refold and re-equilibrate the misfolded RNA structures. And many of these are ATP-dependent motors, but we don't have this in the RNA world, um, or at least not at this point. So what is there to do? So we need to find a way to refold RNAs, maybe in a cyclical way, to drive them towards their... Uh, uh, most active kind of maybe most stable uh, conformation. But the obvious, the obvious uh, regime to do that would be thermal cycling, but we can't do that because high temperatures in the presence of magnesium will degrade our RNA. So what can we do? Now, one thing we found that was rather um, counterintuitive that freezing also tends to refold RNAs. So ice can act as an RNA chaperone. This just shows a hairpin Invasion assay, you have a fluorophore and a quencher next to each other. No signal in this structure, but when this invading strand invades the structure, you get um, a fluorescence turns on. And you can see when you heat these uh, little hairpin structures at 37 degrees in about 60 hours, the fluorescent turns on quite well. But a single cycle of freezing will turn it on to 100%. And uh, maybe even more striking when you have an intramolecular association, so these are hairpins, you have an invading oligo, there's essentially nothing happens uh, at room temperature, but when you freeze it, um, the, the, uh, the fluorescence turns on very quickly. So actually freezing acts as a, um, as a RNA refolding engine. So we wondered if we could now drive the assembly using freeze-thaw cycling, and we built <coughs> Because it's a bit tedious by hand, we built a little free soil cycling machine in the lab. You can see this is the temperature profile cycling between minus 30 degrees and up to 37 degrees and holding uh, for an extended uh, time at minus 9 in the eutectic phase. And you, know, you can immediately see this is much more striking. We can now drive the yield up to 30% thanks to the cycling. And what's even more impressive, the <coughs> RNA polymerase ribosome activity turns on almost instantly in the very first cycles. Um, so that means we can now, now we have an efficient process, we can actually fragment things into much smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. So this, this is now the assembly pathway of the ribosome split into, um, into four pieces, sorry, seven pieces uh, um, and Neither of this is 30, uh, nuclear, uh, longer than 30 nucleotides, which is approximately what is within range from the uh, prebiotic uh, oligomer assembly pro uh, uh, processes. And you can see, again, free soil cycling can drive this uh, to completion. Now, but all of these, all of these RNA fragments were still pre-activated chemically to drive the ligation reaction because the uh, hairpin ligase ribozyme requires a 2 prime, 3 prime cyclic phosphate uh, to, uh, to, to carry out the ligation. But actually, the hairpin ribozyme also carries out the cleavage generating such a 2 prime, 3 prime cyclic phosphate. So we wondered can we drive assembly uh, even without activation chemistry, starting from naked RNA? Such a scheme would look like this. So we, we, we to this in green, we have the fragment we want to assemble. We give it a little um, um, three prime extension, which is recognized by the hairpin ribosome for cleavage. So it cleaves it here and generates the two prime, three prime cyclic phosphate shown this red dot. And then we go through a strand exchange reaction driven by the free thaw cycling, which um, positions the orange strand here, which is there to be ligated. Uh, upstream of the two prime cyclic, uh, two prime, three prime cyclic phosphate, and now uh, we carry on the ligation reaction. <clears throat> and so this is the scheme. Now we now have we now have to proceed in three dimensions because fragments first need to be cleaved before they can move down into the plane where the various assembly pathways 
can operate. And just to show you in a gel how this works, so this is our first piece with a little tag, it needs to be cleaved. Now this is the cleaved form with the 2' cyclic phosphate that can be ligated uh, and needs to be cleaved again. So this is this one here that can be ligated, cleaved again, and then we go full length. So um, this, this shows that actually the assembly can work without any pre-activation chemistry from simple uh, naked RNA. Yeah, with about 10% yield. So I'd like to, to summarize. So complex ribozymes can be assembled from pools of RNA oligomers less than 30 nucleotides long, and they can assemble from these pools without pre-activation and freeze-thaw and potentially other physicochemical cycles. I mean, I think this is an area worth exploring, can drive such assembly reaction by re-equilibrating uh, a misfolded RNA um, conformers and they seem to function akin to an RNA chaperone by affecting iterative refolding and re-equilibration of kinetically trapped RNA structures and complexes. And just to finish on, I might like to make the case for ice as a medium that should be considered uh, in prebiotic terms. You know, if we think of our solar system as maybe a typical planetary system in the cosmos, it's worth noting that ice is abundant liquid water is not. In fact, there's whole celestial bodies in the outer solar system that are built mainly from water ice. And certainly freeze-thaw cycles are still going on, uh, at least on one planet. And with this I'd like to end and thank the, the really brilliant people who did all this work. Um, Vitor Pinero is now an assistant professor at UCL London. He uh, built the CST selection system Alex Taylor did the XNA aptamer and XNA enzyme selections. He's going to be a professor in Montreal. And Chris Cousins did the <coughs> SCAR analysis. Aniela Wachner, a wonderful postdoc from Germany, <coughs> did the, uh, built the CBT selection system. Jamie did all the ice work, and Hannes did the free soil cycling. He's <coughs> now moving to Munich as a uh, young group leader at Max Planck. We had a wonderful collaboration with Pete Herdewein, uh, on the HNA and generally the XNA uh, uh, field and with Kevin Weeks on, on mapping out the XNA enzymes and these I'd like to thank these various bodies for funding us and, and you for listening. Thank you.